So we ended the last discussion uh, with this correlation diagram. And I mentioned that what we want to do is use Tanabe Sugano diagram to describe and quantify uh, the nature of electronic transitions in um, transition metal complexes. So um, let's take our correlation diagram and turn it into its Tanabe Sugano diagram. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically take this line that's right here and we're going to effectively turn it so that it becomes a straight line um, that runs right across the correlation uh, diagram. So the way that, oops, sorry about that. So the way that that's going to look is, uh, is shown here. Um, so what you're really doing is, is the lowest energy state in these diagrams is always illustrating the uh, free ion limit to the strongest extreme field limit. Um, but basically, it, it gives you a ground state now that has constant energy so that you're always measuring anything above that with respect to the same ground state. Um, and then that allows you to correlate the ligand field um, splitting with um, the energy of the, uh, of the transition. So what we're going to do is let's look at the D2 Tanabe Sugano diagram just to finish this problem that we've already started to work on uh, with vanadium uh, 3 plus. So let's now figure out like why do we see two transitions in vanadium 3 plus or the hexagonal complex of vanadium 3 plus in um, its UV vis spectrum. So the way that this is done is we know that the absorptions occur at 17,800 wave numbers and 25,700 wave numbers. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to use the D2 uh, Tanabe Sugano diagram to, to calculate um, what the actual ligand field splitting is going to be as well as the uh, the Raka parameter beta for this or sorry Raka parameter B for this uh, for this complex. And what you'll kind of notice is, is that the ground state here is shown as uh, the triplet F free ion term going straight across the bottom to the triplet T1G uh, ligand field term. And as you're sort of you know kind of looking at this, you'll notice one other you know sort of distinguishing feature. If you have similar looking um, ligand field term symbols, you actually want to specify which free ion term there's arrived from. That's why you'll see um, here it's in parentheses triplet P and in here it's parentheses triplet F. And then finally, there's the uh, third uh, excited state that we're expecting. And remember the, the way that this works now is this no longer looks invariant to ligand field this particular case because we, we turn the diagram. So that's the thing I just wanted you to kind of, you know, keep in mind is suddenly it doesn't look exactly like the correlation diagram when we did not have a constant ground state energy. Okay, but let's, let's, let's do this work. So how do you fit the diagram to the experiment or how do you fit the experimental data to the diagram? So the ratio of the two absorption bands in the visible that you see are 25,700 wave numbers divided by 17,800 wave numbers. And that ratio tells you they're separated in energy uh, by 1.44. And what does that actually mean? It basically means that what you're looking for is what's the ratio of values that are you know, related to the optical transition. In this particular case, it's going to be, you know, effectively um, E over uh, B. But what you're looking for is, is what is the ratio of those values that actually gives you 1.44? And it's approximately um, 42 over 29. So what you're basically doing is then you, you pick 29 here, 42 over here, and you extrapolate over 
And what you'll get is if you do the extrapolation, you'll say that um, I'm going to then say that it, it coincides in that diagram right here. And it coincides on the diagram um, effectively right at um, about 31. So you'll see down here, this is sitting at, at 31. So now we have all the information we need to sort of figure out what, um, what we're gonna actually need to calculate the rest of everything that's going on here. So then we know effectively that, we know that del O um, over B coincides with 31 because we extrapolated. And then this over here is telling you we extrapolated E over B to be at 42 and 29. So what, what's next? Well, we have to calculate B. So we know the um, optical energy of the low or the, the energy of the lowest energy transition. So we can just divide that by B and set it equal to 29 where we extrapolated to. And that tells you that the Rocca parameter here is 610 wave numbers. So if the Rocca parameter is 610 wave numbers, we also know that um, del O over B is 31. So we can then substitute in the 610 here to calculate what the del O value for this compound is, and it's 18,910 wave numbers. And that's effectively what you were able to do is just by simply taking the experimental data, ratioing the energies of the transitions, and then you basically have to extrapolate uh, to values that fit that data on the y-axis. Then you can take those numbers, go back to where they're located on the x-axis, and then basically extrapolate down. And that's how you do this. And then as a result of this, because we know that this is happening at 31, if we were able to observe a third transition, it would actually, again, still be here at 31. And then we can you know, run this you know, over to here as well. But we all, all we need to know, though, is that we know about where that should be um, in terms of energy. And as long as we know the fact that B is 610, we can then calculate everything we need to know using the number on the, on the y-axis. And that would tell us that we expect that the third transition would be about 37,400 wave numbers. Okay, let's look at a different diagram. So if you um, now look at the D7 Tanabe Sagano diagram, Remember, this is the place where we can have um, high spin compounds and low spin compounds. So what you're seeing here is these are the low energy side of the of the Del O um, of the Del O series here on the x-axis. So this is going to be the high spin case, and then you see this line of demarcation that runs down the whole diagram. Once you get to larger values of Del O, that then gives you um, the low spin complexes, and those are where del O is, is large in value. So this break is effectively the break point where you basically see spin crossover. And spin crossover is simply like when you have a high spin to low spin transition. And alternatively, you can actually have a low spin to high spin transition as well. Um, but that changes the spectroscopy that you observe in terms of the UV vis spectrum, as well as obviously the magnetic properties. Um, so basically, at small values of del O uh, over B, they look similar to what we just did. Is we have now, except differences, we have a quartet F ground state, which then breaks into a quartet T1G, a quartet T2G, and a quartet um, A2G. And then we can see there's another parameter here um, or another relevant spin allowed transition. It's a quartet T1G, but then that's derived again from the excited state free ion term. So again, that's, that's invariant with ligand field strength, although it doesn't look like it is here because remember the diagram is turned with respect to the electron correlation diagram. Um, but basically this is the high spin, low spin transition that you observe and then what, what would happen here in this particular case, if you have a D7 ion. 
So you can kind of see what will happen. You, you might expect three allowed transitions on the left side and then three allowed transitions on the right side. And the configurations are totally different in the ground state. Over here, it's a, it's a quartet because it, it should be. It's high spin. And then the low spin analog to that is a doublet EG. So you can, you can see that you can't necessarily differentiate these because it looks like each of them are going to have three spin allowed transitions. They're just going to differ a lot in, in terms of energy. And two of the bands in the high spin, or sorry, in the low spin case, are going to be very, very close in space together in energy. And that can give you indications of, of how to fit these diagrams. But let's go to the example I have. So if we do this a little differently, and I tell you that Del O is known uh, for cobalt hexamine, and it has, a, it has a, a ROCA parameter of 920, you can actually ask how many electronic absorption would you expect for this complex and at what energies? And this is really pretty straightforward, but again, remember cobalt two is, is gonna be D7, so we're gonna use this uh, tanabe sagana diagram. But this is a little easier because Del O over B is actually gonna be 11 in this particular case. So we sort of know already that that's the x-axis um, extrapolation point. So that's where all of the transition energies are gonna emulate from. So right here is where 11 is. And then if you kind of imagine what should the energies of the transitions be, well, we can, we can measure them, you know, like one, two, and three. We know that we're at 11. We know the value of B. So because of that, we sort of know um, everything else that we need to know. I think I approximated it here as 10B just to make it easier. Um, but ultimately, you, you sort of take a look at what's going to happen when you extrapolate all the way across for each case. And when you extrapolate off for each case, you can calculate again what the energies of all the transitions will be. And in this particular case, the lowest energy transition will be um, 9,200 wave numbers. The next highest energy transition will be 16,500. And then the next one will be 21,200. And then just to be very consistent here, the first transition is going to be um, a quartet uh, T um, in this particular case. Um, and I think it's quartet. Uh, I've blocked it here. I can't remember what it is. I have to look back in the other diagram. <laughs> yeah, so it's a quartet uh, T1G. Okay, so the, so the transitions here are going to be a quartet T1G um, to a quartet T2G. That's the lowest energy transition, so that's that one. Then the next transition is going to be a quartet T1G um, to a uh, quartet A2G. That's the next spin allowed transition. And then the third one will be again uh, the quartet T1G to now the uh, quartet T1G, but then because this is derived from a different um, free ion term, we actually put it in parentheses that it's actually derived from the from the quartet T. And that's pretty much how you how you solve problems using Tanabe Sagano diagrams. It's really a straightforward process, and the best way to sort of figure out how to how to um, how to match up everything is, and I'm not showing it here, is if you just have this on pieces of paper, just use rulers to measure everything, and you'll be able to get um, pretty accurate um, transition energies and pretty ac accurate um, ligand field splitting energies from doing this. Um, thank you, and the, the final presentation of the semester will be the next uh, presentation I plan to give. And that will just sort of summarize the, re the remaining aspects of, of critical aspects of electronic spectroscopy applied to transition metal compounds.